Book Three, Chapter Four of *The Food of the Gods and How It Came to Earth*. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex E. Talander, Davis, California. *The Food of the Gods and How It Came to Earth* by H. G. Wells, Book Three, Chapter Four, Redwood's Two Days. One. So soon as Catterham knew the moment for grasping his nettle had come, he took the law into his own hands and sent to arrest Cosser and Redwood. Redwood was there for the taking. He had been undergoing an operation in the side, and the doctors had kept all disturbing things from him until his convalescence was assured. Now they had released him. He was just out of bed, sitting in a fire-worn room, with a heap of newspapers about him, reading for the first time of the agitation that had swept the country into the hands of Catterham, and of the trouble that was darkening over the princess and his son. It was in the morning of the day when young Cattles died, and when the policeman tried to stop young Redwood on his way to the princess. The latest newspapers Redwood had did but vaguely prefigure these imminent things. He was re-reading these first adumbrations of his disaster with a sinking heart, reading the shadow of death more and more perceptibly into them, reading to occupy his mind until further news should come. When the officers followed the servant into his room, he looked up eagerly. I thought it was an early evening paper, he said, then standing up and with a swift change of manner. What's this? And after that, Redwood had no news of anything for two days. They had come with a vehicle to take him away, but when it became evident that he was ill, it was decided to leave him for a day or so until he could be safely removed, and his house was taken over by the police and converted into a temporary prison. It was the same house in which giant Redwood had been born, and in which Heracleophobia had for the first time been given to a human being and Redwood had now been a widower and had lived alone in it eight years. He had become an iron-gray man, with a little pointed gray beard and still active brown eyes. He was slender and soft-voiced, as he had ever been, but his features had now that indefinable quality that comes of brooding over mighty things. To the arresting officer his appearance was in impressive contrast to the enormity of his offenses. "'Here's this feller,' said the officer in command to his next subordinate, "'has done his level best to bust up everything.' and he's got a face like a quiet country gentleman, and here's Judge Hangbrow keeping everything nice and in order for everyone, and he's got a head like a dog. Then their manners, one all consideration and the other snort and grunt, which just shows you, doesn't it, that appearances aren't to be gone upon, whatever else you do. But his praise of Redwood's consideration was presently dashed. The officers found him troublesome at first, until they had made it clear that it was useless for him to ask questions or beg for papers. They made a sort of inspection of his study indeed, and cleared away even the papers he had. Redwood's voice was high and expostulatory. But don't you see, he said, over and over again, it's my son, my only son, that is in this trouble. It isn't the food I care for, but my son. I wish indeed I could tell you, sir, said the officer, but our orders are strict. Who gave the orders, cried Redwood. Ah, that, sir, said the officer, and moved towards the door. He's going up and down his room, said the second officer, when his superior came down. "'That's all right. He'll walk it off a bit.' "'I hope he will,' said the chief officer. "'The fact is, I didn't see it in that light before. "'But this here giant, what's been going on with the princess, you know, "'it's this man's son.' "'The two regarded one another, and the third policeman for a space. "'Then it's a bit rough on him,' the third policeman said. "'It became evident that Redwood had still imperfectly apprehended the fact "'that an iron curtain had dropped between him and the outer world. "'They heard him go to the door, try the handle, and rattle the lock.' and then the voice of the officer who was stationed on the t landing, telling him it was no good to do that. Then afterwards they heard him at the windows, and saw the man outside looking up. It's no good that way, said the second officer. Then Redwood began upon the bell. The senior officer went up and explained, very patiently, that it could do no good to ring the bell like that, and if it was rung for nothing now, it might have been disregarded presently, when he had need of something. Any reasonable attendance, sir, the officer said. But if we bring it just by way of protest, we shall be obliged, sir, to disconnect. The last word the officer heard was Redwood's high pitch, but at least you might tell me if my son... 2. After that Redwood spent most of his time at the windows. But the windows offered him little of the march of events outside. It was a quiet street at all times, and that day was unusually quiet. Scarcely a cab, scarcely a tradesman's cart passed all that morning. Now and then men went by, without any distinctive air of events. Now and then a little group of children, a nursemaid, and a woman going shopping, and so forth. They came onto the stage right or left, up or down the street, with an exasperating suggestion of indifference to any concerns more spacious than their own. They would discover the police-guarded house with amazement and exit in the opposite direction. 
where the great trusses of a giant hydrangea hung up across the pavement, staring back or pointing. Now and then a man would come and ask one of the policemen a question and get a curt reply. Opposite the houses seemed dead. A housemaid appeared once at a bedroom window and stared for a space, and it occurred to Redwood to signal to her. For a time she watched his gestures as if with interest and made a vague response to them, then looked over her shoulder suddenly and turned and went away. An old man hobbled out of number 37 and came down the steps and went off to the right, altogether without looking up. For ten minutes the only occupant of the road was a cat. With such events that interminable momentous morning lengthened out. About twelve there came a bawling of news vendors from the adjacent road, but it passed. Contrary to their want, they left Redwood Street alone, and a suspicion dawned upon him that the police were guarding the end of the street. He tried to open the window, but this brought a policeman to the room forthwith. The clock of the parish church struck twelve, and after an abyss of time, one. They mocked him with lunch. He ate a mouthful and tumbled the food about a little in order to get it taken away, drank freely of whiskey, and then took a chair and went back to the window. The minutes expanded in gray immensities, and for a time perhaps he slept. He woke with a vague impression of remote concussions. He perceived a rattling of the windows like the quiver of an earthquake that lasted for a minute or so and died away. Then after a silence it returned. Then it died away again. He fancied it might be merely the passage of some heavy vehicle along the main road. What else could it be? After a time he began to doubt whether he had heard this sound. He began to reason interminably with himself. Why, after all, was he seized? Catterham had been in office two days, just long enough to grasp his nettle, grasp his nettle, grasp his giant nettle. The refrain, once started, sang through his mind, and would not be dismissed. What, after all, could Catterham do? He was a religious man. He was bound in a sort of way by that not to do violence without a cause. Grasp his nettle, I, perhaps, for example— the princess was to be seized and sent abroad. There might be trouble with his son, in which case— But why had he been arrested? Was Why was it necessary to keep him in ignorance of a thing like that? The thing suggested something more extensive. Perhaps, for example, they meant to lay all the giants by the heels. They were all to be arrested together. There had been hints of that in the election speeches. And then, no doubt they got Cosser also. Ganahan was a religious man. Redwood clung to that. The back of his mind was a black curtain, and on that curtain there came and went a word, a word written in letters of fix. He struggled perpetually against the wet word. It was always, as it were, beginning to get written on the curtain, and never getting completed. He faced it at last. Massacre! There was the word in its full brutality. No, no, no! It was impossible! Catahan was a religious man, a civilized man, and besides, after all these years, after all these hopes, Redwood sprang up, he paced the room, he spoke to himself. He shouted, No! Mankind was surely not so mad as that. Surely not. It was impossible. It was incredible. It could not be. What good would it do to kill the giant human when the gigantic and all the lower things had now inevitably come? They could not be so mad as that. I must dismiss such an idea, he said aloud. Dismiss such an idea. Absolutely. He pulled up short. What was that? Certainly the windows had rattled. He went to look out into the street. Opposite he saw the instant confirmation of his ears. At a bedroom at number 35 was a woman, towel in hand, and at the dining room at number 37 a man was visible behind a great vase of hypertrophied maiden hair fern, both staring out and up, both disquieted and curious. He could see now, too, quite clearly that the policeman on the pavement had heard it also. The thing was not his imagination. He turned to the darkling room. Guns, he said. He brooded. Guns. They brought him in strong tea, such as was he was accustomed to have. It was evident his housekeeper had been taken into consultation. After drinking it, he was too restless to sit any longer at the window, and he paced the room. His mind became more capable of consecutive thought. The room had been his study for four and twenty years. It had been furnished as his marriage, and all the essential equipment dated from then. The large complex writing desk, the rotating chair, the easy chair at the fire, the rotating bookcase, the fixture of indexed pigeonholes that filled the further recess. The vivid turkey carpet, the later Victorian rugs and curtains had mellowed now to a rich dignity of effect, and copper and brass shone warm about the open fire. Electric lights had replaced the lamp of former days. That was the chief alteration in the original equipment. But among these things, this connection with the food had left abundant traces. Along one wall, above the dado, ran a crowded array of black framed photographs and photogravures, showing his son and Cosser's sons, and others of the boom children at various ages and amidst various surroundings. Even young cattle's vacant this visage had its place in that collection. In the corner stood a sheaf of tassels of gigantic meadows, grass from cheesing eyebright, 
and on the desk there lay three empty poppy heads as big as hats, the curtain rods were grass stems, and the tremendous skull of the great hog of oakum hung a portentous ivory overmantel, with a Chinese jar and either eye socket, snout down above the fire. It was to the photographs that Redwood went, and in particular to the photographs of his son. They brought back countless memories of things that had passed out of his mind, of the early days of the food, of Bensington's timid presence, of his cousin Jane, of Cosser and the night work at the experimental farm. These things came to him now very little and bright and distinct, like things seen through a telescope on a sunny day. And then there was the giant nursery, the giant childhood, the young giant's first efforts to speak, his first clear signs of affection. Guns. It floated on him irresistibly, overwhelmingly, but outside there, outside this accursed silence and mystery, his son and Cosser's sons, and all these glorious first fruits of a greater age were even now fighting, fighting for life. Even now his son might be in some dismal quandary, cornered, wounded, overcome. He swung away from the pictures and went up and down the room gesticulating. It cannot be, he cried. It cannot be. It cannot end like that. What was that? He stopped, stricken rigid. The trembling of the windows had begun again, and then had come a thud, a vast concussion that shook the house. The concussion seemed to last for an age. It must have been very near. For a moment it seemed that something had struck the house above him, an enormous impact that broke into a tinkle of falling glass, and then a stillness that ended at last with a minute clear sound of running feet in the street below. Those feet released him from his vigor. He turned towards the window and saw it starred and broken. His heart beat high with a sense of crisis, of conclusive occurrence, of release, and then again his realization of impotent confinement fell about him like a curtain. He could see nothing outside except that the small electric lamp opposite was not lighted. He could hear nothing after the first suggestion of a wide alarm. He could add nothing to interpret or enlarge that mystery except that presently there came a reddish fluctuating brightness in the sky towards the southeast. This light waxed and waned. When it waned he doubted if it had ever waxed. It had crept upon him very gradually with the darkling. It became the predominant fact in his long night of suspense. Sometimes it seemed to him it had the quiver one associates with dancing flames. At others he fancied it was no more than the normal reflection of the evening lights. It waxed and waned through the long hours, and only vanished at last when it was submerged altogether under the rising tide of dawn. Did it mean? What could it mean? Almost certainly it was some sort of fire, near or remote, but he could not even tell whether it was smoke or cloud drift that streamed across the sky. But about one o'clock there began a flickering of searchlights athwart that ruddy tumult, a nickering that continued for the rest of the night. That too might mean many things. What could it mean? What did it mean? Just this strained, unresentful sky he had, and the suggestion of a huge explosion to occupy his mind. There came no further sounds, no further running, nothing but a shouting that might have been only the distant efforts of drunken men. He did not turn up his lights. He stood at his drafty broken window, a distressful, slightly back outline to the officer, who looked ever and again into the room and exhorted him to the rest. All night Redwood remained at his window, peering up at the ambiguous drift of the sky, and only with the coming of the dawn did he obey his fatigue and lie down upon the little bed they had prepared for him between his writing desk and the sinking fire in the fireplace under the great hog skull. 3. For thirty-six long hours did Redwood remain in prison, closed in and shut off from the great drama of the two days, while the little people in the dawn of greatness fought against the children of the food. Then abruptly the iron curtain rose again, and he found himself near the very center of the struggle. That curtain rose as unexpectedly as it fell. In the late afternoon he was called to the window by the clatter of a cab that stopped without. The young man descended, and in another minute stood before him in the room, a slightly built young man of thirty perhaps, clean-shaven, well-dressed, well-mannered. "'Mr. Redwood, sir,' he began, "'would you be willing to come to Mr. Callaham? He needs your presence very urgently.' "'Needs my presence?' They left a question into Redwood's mind that for a moment he could not put. He hesitated. Then in a voice that broke he asked, what has he done to my son? And stood breathless for the reply. Your son, sir? Your son is doing well. So at least we gather. Doing well? He was wounded, sir, yesterday. Have you not heard? Redwood smote these pretenses aside. His voice was no longer colored by fear, but by anger. You know I have not heard. You know I have heard nothing. Mr. Catterham feared, sir. It was a time of upheaval. Every one taken by surprise. He arrested you to save you, sir, from any misadventure. He arrested me to prevent my giving any warning or advice to my son. Go on, tell me what has happened. Have you succeeded? Have you killed them all? The young man made a pace or so towards the window and turned. No, sir, he said concisely. What have you to tell me? 
It's our proof, sir, that this fighting was not planned by us. They found us totally unprepared. You mean— I mean, sir, the giants have, to a certain extent, held their own. The world changed for Redwood. For a moment something like hysteria had the muscles of his face and throat. Then he gave vent to a profound, ah, his heart bounded towards exultation. The giants have held their own. There has been terrible fighting, terrible destruction. It is all a most hideous misunderstanding. In the north and midlands, giants have been killed, everywhere. They are fighting now? No, sir, there was a flag of truce. From them? No, sir, Mr. Catterham sent a flag of truce. The whole thing is a hideous misunderstanding. This is why he wants to talk to you, and put his case before you. They insist, sir, that you should intervene. Redwood interrupted. Do you know what happened to my son? he asked. He was wounded. Tell me, tell me. He and the princess came before the, the movement to surround the Cossar camp was complete, the Cossar pit at Chislehurst. They came suddenly, sir, crashing through a dense thicket of giant oats, near a river, upon a column of infantry. Soldiers have been very nervous all day, and this produced a panic. They shot him? No, sir, they ran away. Some shot at him, mildly, against orders. Redwood gave a note of denial. It's true, sir, not on account of your son, I won't pretend, but on account of the princess. Yes, that's true. The two giants ran shouting towards the encampment. The soldiers ran this way and that, and then some began firing. They say they saw him stagger. Oh, yes, sir, but we know he is not badly hurt. How? He sent the message, sir, that he was doing well. To me? Who else, sir? Redwood stood for nearly a minute with his arms tightly folded, taking this in. Then his indignation found a voice. Because you were fools in doing the thing, because you miscalculated and blundered, you would like me to think you are not murderers in intention. And besides, the rest? The young man looked interrogation. The other giants? The young man made no further pretense of misunderstanding. His tone fell. Thirteen, sir, are dead. And others wounded? Yes, sir. And Catahan, he gasped wants to meet me. Where are the others? Some got to the encampment during the fighting, sir. They seem to have known. Well, of course they did. If it hadn't been for Cosser. Cosser is there? Yes, sir. And all the surviving giants are there. The ones who didn't get to the camp in the fighting have gone, or are going now under the flag of truce. That means, said Redwood, that you are beaten. We are not beaten. No, sir. You cannot say we are beaten. But your sons have broken the rules of war. Once last night, and now again, after our attack had been withdrawn, this afternoon they began to bombard London. That's legitimate. They've been firing shells filled with poison. Poison? Yes, poison, the food. Heracleophobia? Yes, sir, Mr. Catterham, sir. You are beaten. Of course that beats you. It's carcerary. What have you, can you have to do now? What good is it to do anything now? You will breathe it in, in the dust of every street. What is there to fight for more? Rules of war, indeed. And now Catterham wants to humbug me to help him bargain. Good heavens, man! Why should I come to ex your exploded windbag? He has played his game, murdered and muddled. What should I? The young man stood with an air of vigilant respect. It is a fact, sir, he interrupted, that the giants insist that they shall see you. They will have no ambassador but you. Unless you come to them, I am afraid, sir, there will be more bloodshed. On your side, perhaps? No, sir, on both sides. The world is resolved. The thing must end. Redwood looked about the study. His eyes rested for a moment on the photograph of his boy. He turned and met the expectation of the young man. Yes, he said at last, I will come. 4. His encounter with Catterham was entirely different from his anticipation. He had seen the man only twice in his life, once at dinner and once in the lobby of the house, and his imagination had been active not with the man, but with the creation of the newspapers and caricatures, the legendary Catterham, Jack the Giant Killer, Perseus, and all the rest of it, the element of a human personality came in to disorder all that. Here was not the face of the caricatures and portraits, but the face of a worn and sleepless man, lined and drawn, yellow in the whites of the eyes, a little weakened about the mouth. Here, indeed, were the red-brown eyes, the black hair, the distinctive aquiline profile of the great demagogue. But here was also something else that smote any premeditated scorn and rhetoric aside. This man was suffering. He was suffering acutely. He was under enormous stress. From the beginning he had an air of impersonating himself. Presently, with a single gesture, the slightest movement, he revealed to Redwood that he was keeping himself up with drugs. He moved a thumb to his waistcoat pocket, and then, after a few sentences more, threw a consume on the side and slipped the little tabloid to his lips. Moreover, in spite of the stresses upon him, in spite of the fact that he was in the wrong, and Redwood's junior by a dozen years, that strange quality in him, the something, personal magnetism one may call it for want of a better name, that had won his way for him in this eminence of disaster, was with him still. 
On that also Redwood had failed to reckon. From the first, so far as the course and conduct of their speech went, Catahan prevailed over Redwood. All the quality of the first phase of their meeting was determined by him. All the tone and procedure were his. That happened as if it was a matter of course. All Redwood's expectations vanished at his presence. He shook hands before Redwood remembered that he meant to parry that familiarity. He pitched the note of their conference from the outset, sure and clear, as a search for expedients under a common catastrophe. If he made any mistake, it was whenever and again his fatigue got the better of his immediate attention, and the habit of the public meeting carried him away. Then he drew himself up. Through all their interview both men stood, and looked away from Redwood, and began to fence and justify. Once even he said, Gentlemen. Quietly, expandingly, he began to talk. There were moments when Redwood ceased even to feel himself an interlocutor, when he became the mere auditor of a monologue. He became the privileged spectator of an extraordinary phenomenon. He perceived something almost like a specific difference between himself and this being whose beautiful voice enveloped him. He was talking, talking. This mind before him was so powerful and so limited. From its driving energy, its personal weight, its invincible oblivion to certain things, there sprang up in Redwood's mind the most grotesque and strange of images. Instead of an antagonist who was a fellow-creature, a man one could hold morally responsible, and to whom one could address reasonable appeals, he saw Catahan as something, something like a monstrous rhinoceros, as it were, a civilized rhinoceros begotten of the jungle of democratic affairs, a monster of irresistible onset and invincible resistance. In all the crashing conflicts of that tangle he was supreme, and beyond, this man was a being supremely adapted to make his way through multitudes of men. For him there was no fault so important as self-contradiction, no science so significant as the reconciliation of interests. Economic realities, topographical necessities, the barely touched minds of scientific expedients, existed for him no more than railways or rifled guns, or geographical literature exists for his animal prototype. What did exist were gatherings, and caucuses, and votes, above all, votes. He was votes incarnate, the millions of votes. And now, in the great crisis, with the giants broken but not beaten, this vote monster talked. It was so evident that even now he had everything to learn. He did not know there were physical laws and economic laws, quantities and reactions that all humanity, voting nimine contratiente, cannot vote away, and that are disobeyed only at the price of destruction. He did not know where there are moral laws that cannot be bent by any force of glamour, or are bent only by flyback with a vindictive violence. In the face of shrapnel, or of the judgment day, it was evident to Redwood that this man would have sheltered behind some curiously dodged vote of the House of Commons. What most concerned his mind now was not the powers that held the fastness away there to the south, not defeat and death, but the effect of these things upon his majority, the cardinal reality in his life. He had to defeat the giants, or go under. He was by no means absolutely despairful. In his hour of his utmost failure, with blood and disaster upon his hands, and the rich promise of still more horrible disaster, with the gigantic destinies of the world towering and toppling over him, he was capable of a belief that by sheer exertion of his voice, by explaining and qualifying and restating, he might yet reconstitute his power. He was puzzled and distressed, no doubt, fatigued and suffering, but if only he could keep up, if only he could keep talking. As he talked he seemed to Redwood to advance and recede, to dilate and contract. Redwood's share of the talk was of the most subsidiary sort, wedges, as it were, suddenly thrust in. That's all nonsense. No. It's no use suggesting that. Then why did you begin? It is doubtful if Catahan really heard him at all. Round such interpolations, Catterham's speech flowed indeed like some swift stream about a rock. There this incredible man stood, on his official hearth-rug, talking, talking with enormous power and skill, talking as though a pause in his talk, his explanations, his presentation of standpoints and lights, of considerations and expedients, would permit some antagonistic influence to leave into being, into vocal being, the only being he could comprehend. There he stood amidst the slightly faded splendors of that official room in which one man after another had succumbed to the belief that a certain power of intervention was the creative control of an empire. The more he talked, the more certain Redwood's sense of stupendous futility grew. Did this man realize that while he stood and talked there, the whole great world was moving, that the invisible tide of growth flowed and flowed, that there were any hours but parliamentary hours, or any weapons in the hands of the avengers of blood? Outside, darkling the whole room, a single leaf of giant Virginian creeper tapped unheeded on the pane. Redwood became anxious to end this amazing monologue, to escape to sanity and judgment, to that beleaguered camp, the fastness of the future, where, at the very nucleus of greatness, the suns were gathered together. For that this talking was endured, 
He had a curious impression that unless this monologue ended, he would presently find himself carried away by it, that he must fight against Catahan's voice as one fights against a drug. Facts had altered and were altering beneath that spell. What was the man saying? Since Redwood had to report it to the children the food, in a sort of way he perceived it did matter, he would have to listen and guard his sense of realities as well as he could. Much about blood guiltiness. That was eloquence. That didn't matter. Next, he was suggesting a convention. He was suggesting that the surviving children of the food should capitulate and go apart and form a community of their own. There are precedents, he said, for this. We would assign them territory. Where, interjected Redwood, stooping to argue. Catahan snatched at this concession. He turned his face to Redwood's, and his voice fell to a persuasive reasonableness. That could be determined. That, he contended, was a quite subsidiary question. Then he went on to stipulate, and except for them and where they are, we must have absolute control. The food, and all the fruits of the food, must be stamped out. Redwood found himself bargaining. The princess? She stands apart. No, said Redwood, struggling to get back to the old footing. That's absurd. That afterwards. At any rate, we are agreed that the making of the food must stop. I have agreed to nothing. I have said nothing. But on one planet, to have two races of men, one great, one small. Consider what has happened. Consider that it is but a little foretaste of what might presently happen if this food has its way. Consider all you have already brought upon this world. If there is to be a race of giants, increasing and multiplying. It is not for me to argue, said Redwood. I must go to our sons. I want to go to my son. That is why I have come to you. Tell me exactly what you offer. Catahan made a speech upon his terms. The children of the fruit were to be given a great reservation, in North America, perhaps, or Africa, in which they might live out their lives in their own fashion. But it's nonsense, said Redwood. There are other giants now abroad, all over Europe, here and there. There could be an international convention. It's not impossible. Something of the sort, indeed, has already been spoken of. But in this reservation they can live out their lives in their own way. They may do what they like. They may make what they like. We shall be glad if they will make us things. They may be happy. Think provided there are no more children. Precisely. The children are for us, and so, sir, we shall save the world. We shall save it absolutely from the fruits of your terrible discovery. It is not too late for us. Only we are eager to temper expediency with mercy. Even now we are burning and searing the places their shells hit yesterday. We can get it under. Trust me, we shall get it under. But in that way, without cruelty, without injustice. And suppose the children do not agree. For the first time Catahan looked Redwood full in the face. They must! I don't think they will. Why should they not agree? he asked, in a richly toned amazement. Suppose they don't. What can it be but war? We cannot have the things go on. We cannot, sir. Have you scientific men no imagination? Have you no mercy? We cannot have our world trampled under a growing herd of such monsters and monsters' growths as their food is made. We cannot, and we cannot. I ask you, sir, what can it be but war? And remember, this uh, that has happened is only a beginning. This was a skirmish. A mere affair of police, believe me, a mere affair of police. Do not be cheated by perspective, by the immediate bigness of these newer things. Behind us is the nation, is humanity. Behind the thousands who have died there are millions. Were it not for the fear of bloodshed, sir, behind our first attacks there will be forming other attacks, even now. Whether we can kill this food or not, most assuredly we can kill your sons. You reckon too much on the things of yesterday, on the happenings of a mere score of years, on one battle. You have no sense of the slow course of history. I offer this convention for the sake of lives, not because it can change the inevitable end. If you think that your poor two dozen of giants can resist all the forces of our people, and of all the alien peoples who will come to our aid, if you, you can change humanity at a blow, in a single generation, and alter the nature and stature of man, he flung out an arm. Go to them now, sir. I see them, for all the evil they have done, crouching among their wounded. He stopped, as though he had glanced at Redwood's son by chance. There came a pause. Go to them, he said. That is what I want to do. Then go now. He turned and pressed the button of a bell. Without, in immediate response, came a sound of opening doors and hastening feet. The talk was at an end. The display was over. Abruptly, Catahan seemed to contract, to shrivel up into a yellow-faced, fagged-out, middle-sized, middle-aged man. He stepped forward, as if he were stepping out of a picture, and with a complete assumption of that friendliness that lies behind all the public conflicts of our race, he held out his hand to Redwood. As if it were a matter of course, Redwood shook hands with him for the second time. End of Book 3, Chapter 4 of The Food of the Gods and How It Came to Earth Recording by Alex C. Talander, Davis, California www.alexcthalander.com